the recording going. Okay, welcome everybody to the IMSC Algebraic Combinatorics Seminar. And today uh, we have uh, Sheila Sundaram. Uh, she's going to continue the talk last time, uh, Plethistic Inversion and Representation of the Symmetric Group. Sheila, please. So I couldn't remember where I put off. Um, so, <laughs> so the the general theme of the talk was talking about well mostly classism and how you can use it, how it shows up first of all in the representation here in the metric group. Uh, Amri, I am having some audio issues. So is it only me or everybody? Uh, yeah, it seems like the audio is not so good. It was fine just a few minutes ago, but now it's um... it's fine. It's fine with me. Oh. Okay. I can just... hear you guys. It's fine. Is, should I? Yeah. Or, is there something it's I should now. do? It's better. It's... I huh. think it's fine now. It was breaking up a bit earlier. That you can, can you see my slide? Yeah. I'm doing only the audio through the phone. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So if it's really bad, I can I can disconnect the phone, but then I think I might have trouble hearing you, so you will have to. No, it's it's good now. It's good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, I stopped and I want to do with a position head. Maybe if you when you turn to the side, it seems to be big. Stanley, and like I said, there's a lot of confusion about attribution here. Uh, so I'm looking at the co-invariant ring, which is the ring of polynomials in n variables, modded out by the ideal of symmetric. Um, you're you're taking the quotient by the invariant, the non-constant invariant. And when you do that, since the ring is graded by degree, it's a polynomial ring. Then there's this theorem that tells you that if you add up the degree, the pieces that degree congruent to k mod n for a fixed k, it's the same thing as uh, the case power of the primitive unsuited unity induced from the cyclic subgroup up to Sn. And there's a nice um, formula for the multiplicity in this particular representation, cyclic group induced up to SN. It's got a very nice combinatorial interpretation. And someone had asked if that, that's actually true at the lower level of the individual degree pieces. And it, in fact, it is. Um, so it's a theorem of, I guess, Lustig and Stanley. So maybe somebody else knows a better reference, uh, but I had a terrible time tracking down this reference. So the multiplicity in the ice graded piece of the coinvariant ring is just the number of standard tableau whose major index is exactly equal to i. So that's, this is actually the, the first result from which the second one follows. Okay? So that is indeed true. Um, so I found this sort of in a very roundabout way in a 1979 bulletin of the AMS paper by Stanley. I don't know where the actual Lustig 
uh, result is or if he ever published it. So if anybody knows, I please tell me. Okay, so I did want to clear that up. Uh, let's see. And then, so just to, um, oh, so we did this. I, I went through this. Um, okay, maybe I'll come back to this. But, all right, so statistic inverses. I think I sort of stopped here, so let me just spend a few minutes. Um, recapitulation the audio is really, yeah. um, the audio is really up maybe we should try yeah maybe we oh. should try uh yeah uh, okay. Try do, uh, do okay yeah let me disconnect it um so i just hang up right Is that better? Yes, much better. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Great. Okay, so uh, this is an example of a sort of non-trivial statistic inverse result. Um, it says that if you take the oddly representations, their inverse is this expression where you take the odd elementary power sums and divide by the even elementary power sums. So you get a symmetric function. Um, this is not going to be a, a, a sure positive symmetric function. In fact, it's actually got, it's got a nice expression like this in terms of these staircase skew shapes, and it's alternating. Right? Um, so let's see. So these, the expression on the left shows up in other places like in that I don't know very much about, like sure p functions and stuff like that. Um, so from that result, you can actually conclude this. You can you can find the inverse of the alternating sum of the oddly representations, and it looks very similar. You can see that all that happened. Whoops, sorry. All that happened was that the signs alternate. This. This expression is, has been studied before. It's well known, and it's an old result of Carlitz that it is actually sure positive. So this is actually um, the characteristic of a true representation. I don't know where it comes up in a, rep in a purely representation theoretic context. It probably does somewhere, but I don't know. OK, and then I think I had said from, from all this, you can actually get another decomposition of the regular representation. So one of the themes of the talk last week was all these decompositions of the regular representation that are floating around. So this one says that if you take the platism with the oddly representations of the sum of all the hooks, you actually get back the regular representation. And that seems very mysterious to me. There has to be a conceptual explanation, but I don't know what it is. All right, so uh, to go from sums to alternating sums, it turns out that there's actually a, 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 what I call a meta theorem that allows you to do that, like that tells you how to go from one pladistic inverse result to another where, where all you did was change the signs. Um, and it's going to work for k greater than or equal to 2. So, uh, you know, I'm looking at a sum of symmetric functions of degrees congruent to 1 mod k in both cases. And then I just alternate the signs in the, in the sort of natural way. So then if these two, the original two symmetric functions are inverses, then the alternating symmetric functions also have to be inverses. So that's a very nice thing because if you, I mean, if you've tried to compute platisms, it can get, you know, a formal power series, it can get sort of messy. So you don't want to have to, it gets messy, but on the other hand, if you do a lot of them, you find that at some level you're doing the same thing each time. So this theorem is sort of extracting that in, in some generality. Okay, and then I, 
think I got to the Freely algebra. So I wanted to say what the connection was with the Freely algebra. So if you take the degree n multilinear component of the Freely algebra on m generators, um, it's an old result of Brandt that the GL, this is the GLM character. And so this is the same thing as um, this is the same thing as the um, the Frobenius characteristic of the induced representation from the cyclic subgroup when you're inducing just a primitive nth root. So we had this Thrall's theorem, and by the way, one of the things I want to do today is prove Thrall's theorem. Um, so we had this decomposition of the regular representation. So I just wanted to put that in the whole poincare birkhoff witt context. So what it's saying is, so the poincare birkhoff witt theorem says that the universal enveloping algebra is the symmetric algebra. I, this is not, I should fix this. Oops, sorry. Um, is the, This, this should be the symmetric algebra. Let me read that. Yeah. So what if you put those two facts together, then Thrall's theorem is really telling you that the full tensor algebra is the enveloping algebra of the Freely algebra. Right? So it's giving so on the right hand side here, these are the symmetrized. This you should think of this. So this is just another way of thinking about what plethysm means, you should think of this as symmetrizing the Lie modules. That, that's sort of, it helps me to put these things in context. Okay. Um, all right, so here's another uh, plethystic, uh, another old plethystic inverse result. And I'm actually not going to say anything about the context right now. Um, so where where I came into all this was in looking at the partition lattice, so the lattice of partitions of a set of set partitions. Um, and th there was a lot of work being done at the time in the late 80s, early 90s on restricted partitions. So you wanted block sizes, for example, congruent to one mod K. So if K was two, you would be looking at even block sizes or odd block sizes. And all of these post sets were known to be cohen macaulay There was a lot of work of proving that post sets were cohen macaulay shell ability, all of that stuff was going on around this time. So there was always the question when the post set carried an SN action, what was the action on the homology? So uh, this is a result of Calderbank, Hanlon, and Robinson. And they computed the top, the unique non-vanishing homology, the top homology on the post set of partitions with block sizes congruent to, in, they did this in general, J mod K. But when you look at one mod K and you take the alternating sum of those modules, those top homology modules, that the inverse, the plethystic inverse of that is just the sum of all the trivial modules for, of degree one mod K. So that's a pretty amazing result. Um, in the, the, there's actually a conceptual way to think of this that, you know, and I should really be backing up to the, to Cadogan's formula for this. So um, if you replace, if you replace the betas here with the homology of just the full partition lattice, you'd have to tensor, um, oops. you would have to tensor, everything's right. It's not writing. Okay. So just, just re forget about the one mod K. If you did this, then this would just be the sum of the HNs, and this would be the alternating sum of the omega Li Ns, right? This is Cadogan's theorem, the original theorem. 
So you can, if you write down that pleasant, you can think of it as an alternating sum. And what it is is actually an alternating sum of the, what are called Whitney homology modules. So to every um, poset, you can associate a whole sequence of modules called Whitney homology modules. Uh, and you can do it either straight from looking at the poset both ways. So the original Whitney homology, or you can turn the poset over on its head and look at the dual Whitney homology. So the fact that classism works this way, that f of g is p1 is g of f, in this context, is reflecting the fact that the alternating sum of the Whitney homology is basically acyclic, both the original Whitney homology and the dual Whitney homology. So there is a, a very nice sort of topological explanation sometimes for this plotistic inverse stuff. Okay. Um, so from this, you can get um, a lot of other things. So I, I changed, so I, I did something a little subtle here. I moved the sign from here to here. Right? So you can get that. Um, this is from the theorem that says how to go from one platistic inverse result to another one where you've stuck in alternating signs. And then you can also get something if you make k even and you apply the involution omega, unfortunately, it only works when k is even. It's, this is rather peculiar. It's some, another thing that I don't understand. There are a lot of things that I don't understand in all this, um, but there's some kind of discontinuity or something. Anyway, it's actually false if k is odd, this, these statements, but these are certainly true. And um, uh, unlike this first one, I don't know of a topological explanation for the other two. Any questions? I... So uh, for odd K, uh, do you expect some identity of this sort or is it like? Uh, I'm sorry, what's the question? I'm not. So these identities, the, the last two identities, inv9 and inv10, they only work for k even, right? Uh, they work only for k even, right. And I don't know what the formula is for odd k. But do you expect a formula? Do you think there should be something? Uh, uh, well, the, the only reason to expect it, like I said, is because it's, it's a little odd. It's a little strange shouldn't say odd. It's a little strange that it doesn't work for odd k, right? Mm. Um, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't understand where the parity of k comes into the picture. I understand it at the level of symmetric functions. Yeah, when you apply omega to a plethysm, the parity comes in. But, right. you know, I don't understand it in, at, a, at a higher level, I guess. It seems like there should be some explanation. Okay. Um, so if you for forgot about the mod k and you did this in the straight uh, Lee n context, the 9 and 10 you can basically explain by looking at the Orlick Solomon algebra. So the, the uh, Orlick Solomon algebra is an exterior algebra. It's the, the cohomology of the braid arrangement. And that is, it's well known that that's an acyclic complex. And so because it's an exterior algebra and an acyclic complex, you are computing E's plethysm with something else and alternating them in signs. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, so, really, I guess the m most important open question here, which goes back to Thrall's paper, is to find the irreducible decompositions of these pieces, um, these things that I call H lambda of the, these, these pieces right here. 
So there, I think, I believe Thrall called them higher Lee modules. It's been a while since I've looked at his paper. Um, so the irreducible decomposition is only known in very few cases. So if lambda is n, then it's just this, this case is just Lee n. And then we have the that MAD result, the, the um, multiplicity of an irreducible index by lambda is the number of standard young tableau of shape lambda with major index congruent to one mod n. Right? This case is easy because if you compute the pluses and it's just going to be the trivial representation. Right? This is just going to come out to be hn of v1. If you just follow this formula. And this is a well known, this is also known from, I know, 40s, 50s, you know, so this, this would be H A of Li 2, but Li 2 is just E2, and this is, this is well known, right? So I'm, I'm going to write that out a little bit later on. Okay, so also then this one, so here you're just going to, uh, yeah, you're just going to be multiplying that by, you're just going to be inducing it up one. So that one's going to be easy to figure out from this. But otherwise, it's wide open. Uh, oh, actually, that's not true. It's, it's in general wide open. There's, um, there's one the recent um, theorem that I will talk about. Okay, so I wanted to talk about um, the free Jordan algebra, which I don't think people study much. Um, so instead of the Lie bracket, so again, in the 90s, there was a lot of work deforming the Lie bracket. And I believe this was one of the first instances of that. So uh, this is something I did with Phil Hanlon and Rob Calderbank. Um, we thought of replacing the Lie bracket with a plus, and I didn't know anything about this at the time, but this, then we found out that this is something called the Jordan algebra, and it was actually, um, if you, I, don't, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dave Robbins' work. It was his PhD thesis. He studied the free Jordan algebra. Um, so I'm replacing the minus in the Lie bracket with a plus, right? And I'm going to make I'm going to look at the free algebra and again take the degree n multilinear component. If I take that Frobenius characteristic, uh, one of the things that we proved was that H plasism with the odd Lees is exactly that representation, the representation on the free Jordan algebra. So when the odd Lees came up, you know, a few months ago in, in the Plavistic inverse result that I showed you, I was I was very surprised. I was like, wow, I've seen this before somewhere. Yeah, so that's, that's what that is. Um, and you can write down an explicit formula for this, uh, which I didn't, I didn't do, but so you can say exactly what the, the support of the character values of this representation is. Okay, so let's see. So uh, we actually generalize this to, to uh, sorry, uh, I have a question, Sheila. Oh, yes, sure. Uh, on the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, that one. Oh, I see. I see. I was confused about what the. Uh, Okay, thank you. I was not, uh, I missed the line about J, the relation between J n and E time. Thank you. Uh, now it's oh, okay. Yeah, I'm writing eta sub n for the Frobenius characteristic of yeah. J sub n. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, let's see. All right, so you can deform this further by instead of putting a plus, so a plus is uh, the primitive root of, primitive square root of one, right? So we can take any primitive pth root of unity. So actually we started out just putting an alpha, an arbitrary alpha. So then it turns out that if alpha is not a root of unity, this thing just gives you the regular representation. So it's not very interesting. Right? 
So then we went to a primitive piece root of unity. And then you get something really interesting. Um, the theorem is, so I'm, I'm eta sub n of p is the representation of Sn on this particular component of the free algebra with the bracket defined like this. So alpha sub p is a primitive p root of unity. Right? Uh, p does not necessarily have to be prime, even though I'm using the letter p. So it says that the Frobenius characteristic of this representation is a sum of higher Lie modules, and the higher Lie modules correspond to partitions lambda where no part is divisible by p. So just throw away all the parts that are multiples of p. So just like before, we threw away all the odd parts, like we had just odd Lies. Okay. So each of these is a piece of Thrall's decomposition of the regular representation. Um, yeah, okay. I think that's all I wanted to say here for now. You, you can use this to, again, to get character formulas for these things. There's, there's a fairly complicated expression for it. Okay. Um, and then you can play the same game with other representations, like the higher conjugacy modules. If you do this, you get Solomon's result. I think I talked about this already. Um, yeah, so this is, in, in this case, the higher modules, each of them is basically action by conjugation on the class index by lambda. If you just think about that, hopefully you can see that. It turns out to be a multiplicity free sum of power sums. Hello. And so in the character table of SN, what you're doing is if each, if you, uh, every row is indexed by an irreducible character, you're just taking the sum of all those character values. And that would be the multiplicity of a particular irreducible. So this is, like I said, an old, it's like a one page paper of Solomon in the proceedings. He does it in general for arbitrary groups, not just for SN. Uh, but you can also ask, what if you take, so you can view this, again, you can view this as symmetrizing the conjugation action. What if you take the exterior, I'm going to use the word algebra, although there isn't really an algebra. If you take the exterior powers of the conjugacy action, then you get a sum like this. So sum of power sums where now all the parts are odd. So uh, in addition to the fact that this is a nice formula, I think, what it's telling you is that the sum is sure positive. Let's see. Um, you can do the same thing for the Lee and uh, superscript two modules that I talked about, that whose exterior powers give you a decomposition of the regular representation. Uh, if you take their symmetric powers, you get an expression like this. It's again a sum of power sums, and all the parts are now a power of two. Right? So again, it's telling you that this multiplicity sum of power sums, so maybe I should remind you of that. This multiplicity sum of power sums is sure positive. So, um, I, before I had this, um, is one over one minus P one. It's one plus P one plus like that. Okay, so this this one, if you if you took the exterior powers, you get a decomposition of the regular representation. If you take symmetric powers, you get something else. Okay. All right. So um, here here's my list of open problems. Um, the the Combinatorial open problem is why does the number of standard young tableau of a particular shape with index congruent to k mod n depend only on the GCD of k and n? So the GCD of k and n is what determines the representation. Right? When you take the kth power of a primitive root of unity, 
and induce it up to SM. Um, so that's wide open. Nobody knows you know, why that works. So you're adding up these, you know, these descents and you get this major index. Um, so th this is th the others are the problem that I mentioned before. What's the irreducible decomposition for the degree n term in H lambda plethysm with Li or H lambda plethysm with the conjugacy action? Any of these, these H lambda plethysm with these folks characters. The known cases, like I said, are um, when lambda is n, so that's just we n. When lambda is 1 to the n, that's just h n. And then this one was h a of e2. And then recently, I don't know if you can see to the bottom of this, oops the bottom of the screen. Um, okay, there, is that better? Yeah, okay. Um, there's a recent paper of Paul Hegedus and Yuval Hegedus and Yuval Broekman, um, and they compute the multiplicity of S mu in a plethysm like this, H A plethysm would be, they, they, they get a combinatorial formula. They're actually doing something else and I think it was an accident that they came upon this formula. So that's very nice. Um, so they're using these, this notion of cyclic descents. Um, so any questions here? Okay. Let's see. So I wanted to do the proof of Thrall's theorem using the plethysm. So the way, so this should be, I hope, fairly painless. Um, you want to use the expression for the sum of the homogeneous, the exponential expression for the sum of the homogeneous symmetric functions, right? So every, you, we're doing everything with formal power series. So you can take logs. So if you take uh, the log of H plethysm with Li, this is what you're going to get. Uh, here's... Um, so th this is this is Li right here, right? Now the P's commute with plethysm, each PI. So I can move this PI over here. Okay. I can do that. And then plethysm is multiplicative in the first variable. So I can do this, All right? So I've done two, I've actually done two things here. So going from here to here. Uh, this is actually P D plethysm P I to the power N over D. All right. So then um, what happens here is you want to make N over D an integer. So you make a substitution, make a substitution that makes N over D an integer. Right? So I put J equals N over D and that changes my sums. Okay, and then I'm gonna make another substitution. So PD of PI, that becomes PDI to the power of J, right there. Uh, and I make another substitution, I'm gonna put M equals DI, that's what I'm doing here, M is DI. So it's really two substitutions. Okay, and as soon as you do that, things start to fall into place because now you can isolate the, the sum with the Möbius function part. And of course, the sum of mu of d, this is, you're in the divisor lattice now, this is the, the number theoretic definition of the Möbius function. It is going to be one if m is one and zero otherwise. Right? So I put this is the Kronecker delta here. Okay. So you get the sum of p1 to the power j's, which is 
if you, if you remember your McLaurin series for log, it's log of one minus pi p1 inverse. Okay. So that's the proof. Um, any questions about this? Okay. Wait. All right. Um, so oh, you can magical. see where. Sorry. I just said yes. it's all magical. It's I beg all, your pardon? I just said it's all magical. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's not really when when you. After you've done five of these in a row, you start to see what's happening. Well, after I did five of these in a row, I started to see something happening. So if you, you can see that if you replace the mu with phi of d, the totient function, again, you will get something nice, right? Because then this sum will be just m. So in that case, you're going to get 1 over j, um, you're going to get 1 over j p m to the j, right? so you'll get you'll actually get a sum of log of one minus p n inverses. So that's where that first meta theorem, the, that proof of Solomon's result came from. Okay, um, what else was that? Was that? Oops. Okay. All right. So I wanted to talk about these two results, right? So. So this, these are the, the two classically known platisms. I think they were the first ones that I remember learning about. Um, Hn platism with H2 and Hn platism with E2, right? So in the context of this talk, what's important is that this is Hn, of, these are Hn of the conjugacy action and Hn of the Lie representation, right? Because the Lie representation for n equals two is the sign, and the conjugacy action, the two cycles, is the trivial action. All right. So um, they decompose into a multiplicity free sum of irreducibles. The irreducibles are indexed by partitions uh, in the first case where all the parts are even, and in the second case where all the parts are odd. So this, this is a very nice decomposition. Um, there's lots of combinatorics here again. Um, if you look in McDonald or if you look in EC2 in Stanley's book, um, so the the appropriate generating functions here are this this would be i less than or equal to j one minus t x i x j inverse. And then this one would be i strictly less than j, 1 minus t xi xj. And the t kind of keeps track of the size of the one, uh, one yeah, inverse, like that, the size of the partition. Okay. Um, there are also nice formulas for if you replace the outer hn with en. You know, again, it's a multiplicity-free sum of irreducibles, right? But um, I didn't bother to put those down because they don't really fit in this talk, but it, they are nice formulas. Um, let's see. And then uh, I wanted to say something about Reese products because that uh, maybe is a, is a little mysterious, but I wanted to say this because uh, the, when I started thinking about Reese products, I was really, as I said before, coming from the partition lattice. And the partition lattice is really sort of tailor-made for, the, you, you just see the Reese products in, in everywhere. So when you take a set of size n and break it up into equal, say, a set of size 6, and you break, break, break it up into blocks of size 2, then you, know, you can either permute the three blocks among themselves, or you can permute within each block. So this is really a wreath product action. Um, so this is the way I like to think about wreath products. And, you know, it's um, very concrete. Um, so when I talk about the wreath product being this 
this, um, this group right here, that's my wreath product of SM with, wreath, with SN. I'm actually uh, trying to be faithful to the platism convention that I'm using, which is F outside and G inside. So if you look in other books, they, use, they would have written um, SN outside and then wreath the word, the letters WR and then SM, like James and Kerber does this that way, for instance. So it's kind of confusing. But I like to put the SM outside because it's permuting the outer blocks, the, the, the way I, it fits the way I think of it, I guess. Okay, so I'm partitioning the integers from one through MN into N equal intervals of length M. Okay. And then, so I have these uh, N equal intervals. And then I'm going to identify this young subgroup with, with a subgroup of SMN. So um, actually it might be best to go to an example right away. So when I think about uh, right here, if you go down to the bottom, when I think about the young subgroup S3 cross S3 cross S3 cross S3, I'm thinking of it like this. So I'm, I'm just using colors to, to distinguish between the blocks. So this is the permutation one, two in the first block. This is the three cycle one, two, three in the second block. So you have to use the letters four, five, and six. Uh, this is the identity permutation in the third block and the identity permutation in the fourth block. So that's what I'm doing. Okay, and then um, I, wa I also want, I also need a way to identify um, the outside group, the one that permutes the blocks with a subgroup of SMN. And so there's an obvious way to do that. You send a transposition to the permutation with exchanges, which exchanges the letters of the uh, first interval with the case interval. So you're just swapping. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if, if that's clear. So then elements, if you actually wrote down algebraically what these elements are, um, you can start with four elements in S3, but then you want to place them in, in the four blocks and each of the four blocks has different letters in it. So that's what's going on. And this is the formal way of saying that. So con I'm really just conjugating with these sigma i hats, which are the images of the transposition. So every time I conjugate, I replace the original, the letters in the original xi with the appropriate letters corresponding to the block of my partition. I don't know if that's, that was clear or uh, completely incomprehensible. So I'll, I'll, are there any questions? Yes. So someone had asked you. something about these products last time, so I just wanted to say a few words about it. Sheila, it was me who asked, and now everything is clear to me, at least. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, Raghun. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so, okay. So the point is that if you compute the normalizer of this SM cross SM n times, that, and that is the, the group that I'm calling SM square brackets SN, every element has a unique expression like this. It's not hard to show, right? So, so now you can write, you can think of any expression in this wreath product in this way. So again, I, I tried to alternate colors to show you what was going on in each block. Um, so this is the first block, second block, or inter, I guess I'm calling them intervals here. But originally, I start with four permutations in S3, so in the letters one, two, and three, and then I conjugate each one so that the letters get replaced. That's basically what a wreath product is. 
And that's very nice because it allows you to describe very explicitly what, what wreath product modules are. So if I take uh, W to be an SN module and V to be an SM module, I can construct a module for the wreath product in this way, V outside, V bracket, square brackets, W. Um, as a vector space, it's just the M fold tensor product of W. So these are the M blocks that you're permuting, tensor root V, and then um, the action of SM wreath product SN is you can actually write down explicitly what you're doing to one of these tensor products. Basically, you're acting diagonally with the XIs and then you're permuting positions with the sigma. That's sort of what's going on, right? very broadly speaking. So you can check that this is actually a group action. And then the, you can check, it's easy to check dimensions. So every, everything basically works. So, so th this, is, this is what, what I like to work with when I'm doing plethysms. I like to think about this. All right, so the important thing is that, the important fact is that the Frobenius characteristic of this induced module, if you induce this up to SMN, is actually the plethysm of the two original Frobenius characteristics. So that's, that's where the representation theory comes in, the representation theory and the plethysm. Any questions? Uh Hello. Yes. Hi. Yeah. So I have uh, uh, in the part four. If you apply it for the hyperoctahedral roof, then you are getting HN plethysm H two, right? That's right. So it would be uh, yes, correct. Yeah. So the group of type the the vial group for type BN would be SM wreath product S2. Yes. Yeah. Correct. So you can get, you, you can do some, you, if you induce this up to S2MN, you're inducing yeah. representations of the hyperoctahedral group up to S2M. Yes. And each is you are doing the trivial, right? Uh, inducing the trivial and applying the characteristics map to get HN of H2. That's right. Yes. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Very yeah. Much. So that, that one of those classical classes and results that I mentioned is telling yes. you how the trivial representation of the hyperoctahedral group induced up decomposes into reducibles. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay. All right, so um, I, I just wanted, this is, so if you, you can actually motivate plethysm in a completely representation theoretic way by starting with these products. So I just wanted to do that. Um, so if you have an SN module W and an SM module V, and I just realized that N and M are terrible choices for subscripts when you're doing a Zoom talk, because probably nobody can hear the difference. Uh, so I tried to write it out in colors. Um, so you have linearity in the first variable. So in other words, if you add uh, the, direct, the direct sum of two modules where the inner module is the same, works in the way that you expect it to work. And this is exactly what happens with plethysm, right? F1 plethysm G plus F2 plethysm G is F1 plus F2 plethysm G, right? It's also, multiplicative in the first variable. So multiplication here means it's the outer tensor product. So you're taking a tensor product and then inducing up from the direct product. That also works nicely in the way that you would expect it to. And that is a reflection of the fact that plethysm is linear in the first variable. So th this, this one is saying that F one F two plethysm G is F one of G 
what is an F2 of G? And that one was saying that F1 plus F2 of G is F1 of G plus F2 of G. Okay. And then the third one, the third one uh, has something to do with um, a question that, um, let's see, I don't know if Vishwanath asked, so I, I put that in there specifically. So this is, I'm, 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 I'm making this up, by the way, so don't look for it in the literature. I'm calling it inner transitivity of induction. So if I take V lethism with a, a module for H, and I induce that up to K, so I'm taking subgroups, H, H is a subgroup of K here, and W subscript H is an H module, so I can form the module V bracket WH and induce it up from, from SM of H to SM bracket K. Well, that turns out to be the same thing. Again, it's what you would expect. It turns out to be the same thing as if you induced the inside module first and then took the wreath product with the original outside module. So the reason I wanted to mention this is because our Lie modules are actually induced from cyclic subgroups. So we're, we're actually looking at things when, when we say, um, say HN of Lie K, and I'm viewing this as an SNK module. So you, you think of this as something that's being induced from, uh, can you see that? from SN wreath product SK up to S, oops, SNK. But the Lie module itself is an induced module, right? It's HN, it was omega, like that, induced from the cyclic subgroup of order K. So I end up you, you can either think of this module as being induced from a normalizer, or you can think of it as actually being induced from the centralizer. So in other words, I can think of this, my matter room here, um, I can think of this as being induced from SN of CK up to SNK. So rather than thinking of it as being induced from a normalizer, you're thinking of it as being induced from a centralizer. So actually everything, just about everything that I talked about has to do with modules that are being induced from centralizers of elements of the symmetric group rather than from normalizers. So you, go, you start with the centralizer and then you induce up to the normalizer and then to the full group. So can this, does this give a proof of Thrall's result uh, also using representation theory? Well, no, because um, uh, you'd have to do the, I mean, there's just, uh, let me just think about this. I'm not sure. I, I think you'd have to do a calculation that's equivalent to what we did before. But I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay. So it doesn't... Yeah. I, I, I don't think so. No. Okay. Um, any, any other questions? So I think that was actually all I had. Um, I had some references. Um, if you've never worked with wreath products before and you know you like combinatorial questions, I added a reference at the end. Um, some of the stuff of, on wreath products I, I lifted shamelessly from an old paper of mine where I worked all this out for, for specifically for combinatorics, for the combinatorics crowd. So it's, it's written in a very elementary way. So you, you might want to take a look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
and I think that's that's it. Thank you. And I just here's what I wanted to do last time. Um, there you go. I finally got to do it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so if, if you don't speak Tamil, that's that's thank you. And that's Nanri is Nanri is thank you in Tamil. Thank you, thank you, Sheila. Uh, it was uh, very nice. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, can, could I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, yes. So I'm just curious about this. So I guess I have a couple of questions. So uh, when you say uh, this major index of, um, um, let's see, uh, you, you talk about the major index of a standard young tableau, right? Yes. So, uh, uh, how does it relate to the major index of a permutation per se? Ah, yes. So, uh, the robinson shenstead correspondence. Okay. That's, that's the connection. Um, so, let's see. Mm, yeah. What is, sorry. Uh, so, the Robinson, uh, so RSK takes a permutation sigma to a pair of standard Young tableau, right, of the same shape. Okay. And it is an truly, uh, it is, it's a truly amazing correspondence. It will preserve descents, right? So a descent in the permutation will translate into a descent in, oops, uh, in the, recording tableau in Q, right? So okay. you, you do have a bijection like that. Right? Okay. So major so, index of the permutation, you can you can track major index of the permutation by major index of the tableau. Oh, of the Q tableau. Yeah. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so, so, you know, one idea for proving these things is, is to, uh, is somehow find some kind of correspondence from the the elements in the ring of invariance onto pairs of tableau and and be able to track by major index but it's 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 really amazing i don't think somebody somebody in the audience i'm sure knows a lot more about this than i do i don't even think there's a natural basis known for the ring of coinvariance even for the symmetric group like, I mean, it's supposed to be the regular representation. Is there, is there an obvious basis that's permuted? So I don't know. Okay. Uh, the, I guess the, the other question I had was, so you mentioned that somehow um, the, when you um, look at this, this Stanley's result on the number of um, uh, standard young tableau with major index congruent to k mod n, it yes. should only depend on the GCD of k and n. Yes. Uh, because, so I didn't quite catch the reason, uh, you, you said because when you induce up from cn. Yes, because, correct, it's the decomposition of, so if I take a, um, let's see, if I take a primitive nth root of unity and I take it to the, whoops, Sorry, uh, what did I do? Okay. Okay. Raise it to the power K, right? And then I induce up from CN to SN, and I decompose that into irreducibles. So, the irreducible chi lambda appears with that multiplicity. It's the number of standard young tableau of shape lambda and major index congruent to k mod n. Okay. 
but the GCD comes into play because you're saying omega k, and if if you pick k dash, uh, but then there yes. would be only there's an outer automorphism, right, of C n, which would relate. Uh, right. So, so when you uh, that's right. The, the representation depends only on the grade the GCD. Ah, I see. I see. So one, once when you induce up, there is uh, okay. Okay, I understand. Okay. Yes. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. When, when, oh, you do have to induce up, right? It's not obviously not true. I, I right. mean, without inducing, there the distinct n irreducibles of C n. But right, right. once you induce up, yeah. Got it. Okay. Fine. Okay. Thanks. So, sure. So, so you you say this is still open, is it? Meaning. We uh, still don't know why. Combinatorial proof of fact. So this is a you know, yeah, it's still open. So Fulks has a very explicit um, formula for a very explicit formula for this expression in terms of power sums, like with with the Ramanujan sums. Right. right. So if you go from there to here, nobody knows how to do it. And nobody knows even how to show that it's not doesn't depend on k that it only depends on the GCD of k and n. So if you look in in the references, I wrote out specific exercises in EC two in Stanley's book, and it's all it's all written there. This is a very old, well known problem. Uh, in fact, I I probably thought about it as a graduate student and immediately abandoned it. <laughs> It looks hard. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Sheila, I have a question on uh, the question you asked. Could you repeat that question uh, about uh, something about the covariant uh, ring, uh, some basis for it? What yes. Was, could you repeat the question? Please? Oh, repeat the question. Yes. Uh, so I said, I don't even think it's uh, a natural basis for the co-invariant ring is is known. Um, so uh, well, I have so a I'm, I'm taking, to make on that. Uh, let's see, E1 through E. I'm, I'm just going to do that, right? Yeah. So it's a direct sum of these pieces that I call, I called them Ri. Yeah. Um, so all, if you just, even if you just ignore the grading, this is a this is supposed to be the regular representation. Mm -hmm. But I don't think a natural rep, uh, basis is known, something that's obviously permuted and that's nice that, that you can work with and get combinatorial results out of. Okay. Uh, maybe Do you uh, know? the following is obvious. Uh, 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 if you can think of it, I think, as the cohomology of the uh, Full flag variety. Yes. And therefore, there are the Schubert classes, but that's not what you want, I guess. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I don't think that's. Um, that's not what you meant. So, so actually, you say actually, a basis, I will, what properties do you want? That's the question. Well, are, are the are the Schubert classes obviously permuted? No, 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 no. I'm not saying no, 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 no. Okay. Uh, no, I <laughs> yeah, don't know the. I, 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 no, I was just saying that they form a basis, but uh, uh, so yeah. you want. Uh, hmm. So these are these are um, um, so Schubert classes. So now we're going into algebraic geometry, right? But this is I'm saying this is a very simple polynomial ring with a you know you're, you're modding out by something. Is is there something that where you can say, look here are the n factorial elements and they're obviously being permuted? Like this is the regular representation. I, I I I since it's the regular representation and it is uh, induced from a group uh, action on a set, you want to identify that set, I guess. That's, is that is that? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm, is it, could you turn up your mic maybe? I'm having yeah, trouble uh, hearing um, you. The regular representation, <clears throat> being the regular representation, it is induced from the action on a set. 
Yes. And you want to identify a particular set inside that, which which it's permuted. I suppose that's is that okay. a reasonable thing to rephrase okay. your question? Yeah, um, maybe maybe you can write that down for me because I'm not oh, getting anything okay, here. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry, sorry. I, I'm unable to write mm -hmm. it down. Maybe some uh, Amri or Vishwanath can. No, but aren't there in factorial Schubert classes? So there are in factorial Schubert classes right there, and uh, so there is, but there is no action that one can think of on that. No, see the point is uh, S N. Uh, will not permute them or anything. Will not act by permuting them. That's the point. Yeah, that's what I want. I want. I want uh, something that's being permuted by SN. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I got the question. Thank you, Sheila. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. So maybe uh, no. I was just wondering again about that. Uh, what Raghavan was mentioning. So maybe there's some partial order on these basis elements and uh, somehow this, this could be related to yeah, some pa partial order. You think these could be related to Schubert polynomials? Uh, uh, oh, um, yeah, there are lots of things. Um, actually, I think the two people who know vastly more than I do uh, have left. Mike Zabrocki and Anna Schilling, um, oh, especially both. Mike Zabrocki. You know all this work on diagonal harmonics and things like that? That's all related. You know, now they've generalized this, this co-invariant ring. There's a co-invariant, uh, a there's a ring of super co-invariants and they're, I don't know, fermionic invariants and bosonic invariants. There, there are all these things. <laughs> so uh, cool. they so, probably okay. know so, a lot more. OK, I'll ask Mike when I see him. Yeah. Um, Amri, just to uh, comment on your question, indeed, uh, that is correct. I mean, Schubert polynomials are, are supposed to represent Schubert classes. And so, and their multiplication is right. Supposed, yeah, so you, you're, the, so, it is, in fact. No, that's true, but then they don't quite answer this question, right? So maybe no, no, no. Uh, this somehow is, uh, the combinator. Yeah, this is the SN action on that. So that is quite a different ballgame, I think. Right, yeah. right. So, but I was wondering if those kind of tools are somehow relevant to this. Uh, yeah. Anyway, vague, vague remark. Of Ignore it. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording this now. Um, okay. Yeah, unless there are more questions. Um, okay. So if there are no more questions. Well, thanks a lot once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.